Ted, let me follow up on this point because we focus on this is living history we're experiencing <coughs> right here. You were in the room. The president was asking his closest associates for advice of options. What did you tell him to do or not to do? Over the, the period of that first week, when fortunately we were meeting in secrecy, which sometimes has its advantages, the Soviets did not know that we knew. So they did not take any sudden action that would have made it impossible for us to plan calmly and quietly, nor did they publicize that they had the missiles there, which would probably have panicked the American public and press and Congress to make further demands upon the president. And uh, it's a long story, which I don't want to use the old dodge. It's all in my book. But it so happens, <laughs> it so happens that uh, that particular story is spelled out in detail in my book. Indeed, it begins with a prologue about my own role in the crisis during those 13 days and the fact that one of my first, re one of the first requests to me came from the president's brother, Robert Kennedy, the attorney general, who said that, if you go back now to moral authority questions, he said that if the United States were to commit a surprise bombing attack on a small island and innocent civilians working at that site, probably Cubans, not Russians, would be killed, that would look like Pearl Harbor in reverse. Mm -hmm. And we, as a moral matter, as a matter of our place in history, he thought there would have to be some kind of notification. The Air Force wasn't too happy about notifying its targets. Mm -hmm. They said they'll simply move the missiles into the bush or under some kind of camouflage but I was asked by the XCOM, which is what we called the group, because it uh, had no official name until it was called the Executive Committee of the National Security Council. I was asked to draft a high-level message from Kennedy to Khrushchev to be delivered by a special emissary telling him that we knew and that unless they those missiles were removed and dismantled promptly. Bombs would fall. And once uh, I was given the task, I was then given by everyone around the table uh, conditions that my draft had to meet. Don't make it sound like an ultimatum because a great power will never agree to an ultimatum. Don't make it too complicated because Khrushchev will negotiate for weeks on any complicated provisions. Don't make it overreaching or history, if there is any history, will blame us for mankind's final war. And finally, um, I had to return to the meeting and say, there is no letter that could meet all of those conditions. Of course, when you're threatening to uh, bomb somebody unless they take action, it's gonna sound like an ultimatum and all the rest. <laughs> At that point, the tide of opinion around the table, we were meeting in the cabinet room, began to shift toward the other leading option on the list, which was a blockade around Cuba that would at least signal to the Soviets that we were responding, and, and but it was responding in a passive way, not by attacking them and launching a war. Ultimately, we called the blockade a quarantine because a blockade could be an act of war also. And when finally a consensus of the group uh, favored uh, the, uh, the, uh, the blockade or quarantine, we called the president who had been on a trip because he felt it was important we all keep to our regular schedules <clears throat> and not signal the Soviets at any high level crisis meeting was going on. We called the president to come back, and I'm proud to say I presented him upon his landing a one-page memorandum, which is in the book and summarizes what I thought was the irrefutable case against the airstrike and invasion. 
and the irrefutable case for the blockade quarantine uh, option. The president then uh, decided in favor of that second option and uh, asked me to prepare his remarks to the American people. All this had begun on Tuesday morning, October 16, when he called me into his office, and he went on nationwide television on October 22nd, only six days later. And that speech laid out in full for the American people and the world what it is the United States had discovered, what it meant in terms of a threat to world peace and security, and what the United States was going to do about it. Well, I have to say that uh, a good many people about your age, uh, Jerry, maybe a little younger, have uh, said to me when I speak on this subject, they thank me for making the president's speech on the night of October 22nd so scary that they could convince their girlfriends that it was their last night on earth. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very for that.